Hello and welcome to Civil War Weekly, the podcast that answers the question, what happened this week in the American Civil War? I am your host, Tim Patrick, and this is episode 4, April 12th to the 18th, 1861, Fort Sumter. We left off last week with an official declaration of secession by South Carolina and other states of the Deep South. This week, we will take a look at our first official shots of the war, and perhaps one of the reasons why the war lasted for as long as it did in the secession of Virginia. But without further ado, let's go ahead and get into it. December 20th, 1861 saw South Carolina remove itself from the Union by a vote of 169 to 0. So pretty one-sided there. I mentioned last week that Robert Anderson, Major Robert Anderson that is, is the commander of the Federal Forces stationed in Charleston Harbor in South Carolina, and he had withdrawn his men to Fort Sumter on December 26th, so just a couple days after that vote. Now, I did not just say that to put a random fact out there. It actually does play at least a small part in our story for this week. I promise you there is, in fact, a method to my madness. Now, I know you may be tired of hearing me say this, but we do need to backtrack just a little bit so that we can get the full context. South Carolina had sent three delegates to Washington to meet with President James Buchanan. It was mentioned to the president that the men from South Carolina should be arrested, but the president declined. Buchanan has been described as a timid man, and he would be cautious throughout the last days of his presidency. His lack of action usually places him on the tops of every worst president list that you may find. I do think that the situation was unique, and that heavy-handed action could have provoked even more states to open rebellion. Remember, Virginia, North Carolina, Arkansas, and Tennessee, the Upper South, had not yet joined the Confederate cause. In addition, there were the slave states of Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, and Delaware, and, you know, not a whole lot of people think of Delaware as a slave state, but it was, you know, it was below the Mason-Dixon line. There were a lot of Quakers, though, who had settled there, so there was not as as prevalent as these other states, but uh, we can we can lump them in there with these other these other three, um, and these these states would not end up seceding ultimately, but certainly that was not known to President Buchanan at the time, uh, unless he could you know see into the future, which uh, I'm almost certain that he could not. So uh, there's always the threat that these states will in fact join the Confederate cause as well, as if being surrounded by these states who did have slavery legalized was not enough. Uh, Washington, D.C. as well would resemble more of a southern town than anything. One walking around the city would see slaves, although the trade in the city, the international trade, had been abolished in one of those compromises that we had talked about in a previous episode. um, There was still internal trade, so certainly there was the buying and selling of humans Uh, not far from the White House, which uh, is is sort of a tough thing to think about. So President Buchanan is living in this city with, certainly there are other uh, members of uh, the government who are uh, Southerners who own slaves as well, so um, he's living in that kind of environment. So that's something that we don't always think about when we're talking about President Buchanan and his his decision-making. Most of the federal troops were also stationed in the West, not the more civilized East. For example, Anderson only has 81 men under his command in Charleston. Mobilization had already begun in southern states, with militia units forming after John Brown's raid. There were even militia units in Washington, D.C. to protect the uh, slave trade that was already there, so there there were certainly folks who supported slavery in the nation's capital. Buchanan also believed that there was a possibility for reconciliation. In the early stages of his presidency, Lincoln would think exactly the same. 
In fact, in his inaugural address, Lincoln will state that he does not have the legal right to touch slavery. Uh, that's something that he, he actually says when he's taking office. Uh, you know, at that point, it's, it's a little late, but that's something that he does, he does mention. Finally, Buchanan was the outgoing president. Even today, there are arguments about what a president should do in terms of policy during their final days. I think there are many factors that go against Buchanan, and while yes, I think he could have done more, it is not necessarily fair to say that the war could have been prevented. Maybe if our good old friend Andrew Jackson, say, was president, things could have been different. At 67 years old, Andrew Jackson actually beat a would-be assassin with his cane after his pistol misfired. Needless to say, there would have been a fiery response uh, to South Carolina as there was before during Jackson's actual presidency. While the delegates were in D.C., it was agreed that there would be no troop movements on either side, the federal forces or the gathered South Carolina militia units. Francis Pickens, the newly elected governor of South Carolina, a proud Democrat and supporter of secession, protested this move. Specifically, South Carolinian delegates would be discussing the federal troops still stationed in Charleston and hopefully the transition of the forts in the harbor under their control uh, without any kind of bloodshed. It should be important to note here that all across the southern United States, there are uh, federal possessions that are being transferred into the hands of state militia units. Um, and Fort Sumter is really one of the last forts remaining that still has a federal presence in the South from these states that have already seceded. Major Anderson, though, had received orders from the Secretary of War at the time, who was John Floyd, a native Virginian, who wanted, obviously his motivations are, he wants all of the federal possessions to be in the hands of the southern states, and he sends an order to Anderson that he needs to evacuate the forts. So Anderson pours over this order, and he, he doesn't want to give it up to the rebels, and he's, he's very dedicated to his job, and he's, he's been a soldier, so he wants to serve his country and continue doing so. Um, so... He looks at the order and he actually finds a little loophole in there and the orders say to evacuate the forts and that's plural forts. So he actually withdraws his troops to Fort Sumter. So he's only in one fort, uh, technically obeying these orders, but you know, not really. This is a good tactical move by Anderson because Fort Sumter could not be assaulted by land. So he is making a good decision. Now, why could it not be assaulted by land, you might ask? Well, the geography of Charleston Harbor is important for understanding the story, and I do hope to post a picture to the website so that you get a better idea, but Fort Sumter was a man-made island fortress that stood in the harbor. Anderson surmised that if an assault came, it would be by land. Eventually, 500 Southerners would form assault parties which would mean Anderson was greatly outnumbered. It was a smart move to withdraw to Fort Sumter, as we've already mentioned. Morris Island to the south contained Battery Greg that would face Sumter. Sullivan Island to the north housed the previously mentioned Fort Moultrie. An additional floating battery was constructed off of Sullivan Island, as well as James Island to the east, which housed Fort Johnson. Each of these areas could and would bring cannon fire down on Sumter. Still, Sumter was not without their own firepower. The fort had two tiers that combined to carry 75 pieces of artillery and additional mortars on the parade ground of the fort. Sumter would also have a seasoned military commander in the already mentioned Robert Anderson. Robert Anderson was a career soldier born in Kentucky in 1805. After graduating from West Point in 1825, he would be commissioned into the 3rd Artillery. He serves with distinction in the Black Hawk War, the Seminole, 
and Mexican-American War, Anderson would translate artillery text from French into English during his time teaching at West Point. Interestingly, Major Anderson did not necessarily disagree with slavery, having come from a slave state and having at one point owned slaves himself. His loyalty, as already mentioned, was to the federal government, which he had served faithfully for many years. Anderson was given command of the defenses in Charleston in November of 1860 as a response to South Carolina potentially seceding. So he is placed there, the right man for the right job here. And that is despite some of his subordinate officers who are a little bit dubious of his motivations because he has come from this background, uh, but he's going to prove himself uh, here shortly. Across the harbor from Anderson was Pierre Toutant Gustave Beauregard. PGT will play a continual role in our story as it unfolds, and he is definitely a contestant for Coolest Name Award in the Civil War. Just as a digression, a general of militia units that surrounds Sumter is also State's Rights Gist. That's his name, so just in case you were wondering how South Carolina feels about uh, all these events, uh, this guy's name is State's Rights, so that should give you your answer. Anyway, PGT Beauregard was born in Louisiana in 1818. During the Mexican-American War, he serves on Winfield Scott's staff as an engineer. When his native Louisiana secedes, Beauregard will resign his commission and join the Southern cause. The Confederate government gives him the highest rank up to that point in their army of Brigadier General. That same government that we're going to talk about in a future episode gives him orders to fire on the fort if necessary to prevent reinforcements. Interesting to note, the Southern General would be very familiar with his counterpart across the harbor because Anderson had actually been his teacher at one point when Beauregard had attended West Point. So they are very familiar and very cordial with their uh, communications back and forth uh, throughout the whole process. On January 9th, 1861, the steamship Star of the West rolls into Charleston Harbor in an attempt to resupply Sumter. On board, there are actually 200 reinforcements as well. Batteries from Sullivan and Morris Island will open fire on the ship, scoring two hits that do no damage but definitely turn the Star of the West away so they sail out of the harbor. Anderson and the defenders of Sumter will seek to not escalate the situation, and do not return fire from the Confederate batteries. These we can say, in all these firsts that we're going to have here early in these episodes, these we can say are a contender for first official shots of the war. With the failure of resupply in January, resources at the fort were running low. On April 4th, Lincoln grows tired of waiting and authorizes relief efforts in the form of naval vessels, Powhatan, Pocahontas, and Pawnee. Additionally, the cutter Harriet Lane and steamship Baltic will be accompanying the expedition along with three civilian tugs. Pawnee will leave Norfolk, Virginia on April 9th. Norfolk was the largest naval base at this time and is going to play a little bit of a role here uh, as Virginia secedes from the Union. Lincoln informs Governor Pickens that the efforts would be to resupply, not reinforce, unless the fort is fired upon. I think that this shows that, yes, while there could be a peaceful solution that we can still work things out, uh, it also shows that Lincoln has some political skill uh, as well because he is telling Governor Pickens that this this is going to happen, so it's, it's no surprise to the Confederates that A ship is coming into the harbor or an expedition has has set out. Um, He's essentially telling them, though, that if you want to start a war, if you want to uh, do something, then you're going to be the one who's going to fire the first shots. I'm not the aggressor. I'm only trying to resupply these guys in the fort. So uh, that's an interesting look into his mindset. On April 11th, Beauregard will demand the surrender of the fort 
and the evacuation of the Union troops. In Anderson's reply, he states, I regret that my sense of honor and of my obligations to my government prevent my compliance. Beauregard is under pressure from the Confederate government. April 12th would see the first ships of the relief party arrive, so he's running out of time. Beauregard receives the following communication from the Confederate Secretary of War. Do not desire needlessly to bombard Fort Sumter. If Major Anderson will state the time at which, as indicated by him, he will evacuate and agree that in the meantime he will not use his guns against us unless ours should be employed against Fort Sumter, you are authorized thus to avoid the effusion of blood. If this or its equivalent be refused, reduce the fort as your judgment decides to be most practicable. At 3.20 a.m. on the 12th, Beauregard informs his former teacher that the bombardment would commence in one hour. At 4.30 a.m., the first shot is fired from Fort Johnson on James Island. A 36-hour bombardment commences, which saw over 3,000 rounds fired on Sumter. Due to the heavy fire from the shore batteries, the upper tier of the fort is deemed indefensible, as it is too exposed. Should be important to note here as well is that Fort Sumter is a coastal defense, so they are defending against somebody coming in from the ocean. But if you are having batteries fire on you from, say, the, your rear, the backside there, um, that's not what the fort is necessarily designed for. So. Uh, the gate is on the back side of the fort where uh, some of the batteries are going to be aiming at there. Unfortunately, a storm had hit the relief force and scattered the vessels, some of whom had to return to friendly ports. Only the Baltic, Harriet Lane, and the Pawnee arrived by 6 a.m. Through conflicting orders, Powhatan had been redirected to Florida and carried the launches that would be needed to land men and supplies so the ships that did arrive were forced to watch as the bombardment commenced. At approximately 7 o'clock, the Union forces began to return fire. Lieutenant Abner Doubleday is the first to aim a shot back at the Confederates. Doubleday is from New York and will become a general in the Union Army. He is also sort of a legendary figure claiming to have invented baseball. There is no evidence that really supports this claim other than the fact that Abner Doubleday says that he invented baseball, though. I will say, though, that the Washington Nationals do have a Class A affiliate team from Auburn, New York. That where Auburn is where Abner Doubleday was from, and they are the Auburn Doubledays, so that's a pretty cool nickname. Pretty unique. The effectiveness of the Confederate fire was displayed. Many of the Union guns were knocked out, only six being able to return fire later on the 12th. Moultrie had a special furnace that could produce hot shot. The heated shot would set fire to enemy ships and other wooden structures. One such shot hits the main barracks of the fort, which catches fire and burns, with the defenders unable to respond due to the continual Confederate bombardment. Mary Chestnut was the wife of James Chestnut Jr., the first senator to resign his post and join the new Provisional Congress of the Confederacy. Although being married to James, who would serve in the Confederate Army, Mary would be privately against slavery, writing, God forgive us, but ours is a monstrous system. She would keep a daily journal in 1861 and witnessed the bombardment of Fort Sumter. She mentions in her diary, I sprang out of bed, and, on my knees, prostrate, I prayed, as I have never prayed before. Mary would keep her diary throughout the war, and in 1982, a fully annotated version will win the Pulitzer Prize. At 1 o'clock on the 13th, Lewis T. Woodfall rose to Sumter to demand the fort surrender. Anderson had only 700 rounds of ammunition, and food supplies had run out he would agree to surrender the fort. Beauregard would allow the Union commander to take with him the flag, now riddled with holes. The only fatalities actually of the engagement occur during a salute to this flag. 
cartridges are set alight during a misfire and explode. One Union soldier is killed outright, with five wounded, one mortally. These are the first men killed during the war, but they will not be the last. After the fall of Fort Sumter, the writing was on the wall. April 15th would see Lincoln call the remaining states and territories of the Union to provide 75,000 volunteers for military service. As previously mentioned, the Federal Army at the time was small and consisted of only 17,000 men, mostly in the West. More would be needed if the South was to be reclaimed. In addition, many of the officers in the Army would join the Southern cause. The enlistment period for the 75,000 men would be 90 days. As both sides prepare for war, there is a view that it would be over quickly. Young men enlist north and south with excitement. In the north, defending the attack on the U.S. flag grew men into a fervor. The defenders of Sumter would be treated as heroes as they returned to Washington. The south saw equal enthusiasm. One man enlisting in Alabama claimed that his brigade could whip 250,000 Yankees, himself personally 25. So, pretty reasonable. I, we can take 250,000, but I'll, I can only take 25 myself there. The time for reconciliation was over, though. Lincoln could see that war was the only way now to prevent the unraveling of a nation. On April 17th, Virginia secedes from the Union. This was hardly as foregone a conclusion as it was with South Carolina. The vote was much closer, 88 to 55. But why? I think in many histories, we just get the bold conclusion of, yes, the southern states seceded from the Union, and the Civil War began. The end. We mentioned earlier that the Upper South had not yet declared their departure. Many of these states, including Virginia, would hold conventions and not vote for secession originally. In the state of Tennessee, we see that they even denied a convention to discuss the matter. Arkansas, Tennessee, North Carolina, and Virginia comprised of what we consider to be the Upper South. These states had less slavery than the rest of the South. In fact, only 25% of families were slave-owning. Due to their location, they were also closer to the free northern states, and thus would have more association with them. Virginia would actually call for delegates from northern and southern states to participate in a peace convention and hopefully avoid war. This convention was actually led by our old friend John Tyler, so he's still around, still kicking. Despite their reluctance at first, when news that Fort Sumter had surrendered reached Richmond, Virginia, the citizens rejoiced. The American flag was replaced with the Confederate. A further for action swept through the people. When April 15th rolled around and Lincoln called for Virginia's contribution for troops, it was met with rejection. Even further, it meant that Virginia would have to make a decision, to stay with the Union or to fight against fellow southern states. Either way, northern invasion would seem imminent. Virginia delegates would meet for two days and debate the issue, eventually voting for secession. May 18th, voters would approve the ordinance. Now, you may be listening to the podcast and notice I am talking a lot about what Virginia is doing. Virginia secession, I think, is important for many reasons, and not just because I sit here recording in that very state. In 1860, it was the richest and most populous of the southern states. Richmond, the capital, was the only city which could compete in terms of industry with the northern states. 20% of the railroads in the south were in Virginia. Tredegar Ironworks of Richmond would produce 1,100 cannon for the southern cause. There would also be several flour mills in Richmond key to feeding the Confederate armies. And if you're combining the railroads with the Shenandoah Valley, which is very fertile, has a lot of wheat there. So they're sending it all to Richmond so that we can make food for the army. 104 men from Virginia would serve as generals in the Confederate armies. Many of the most iconic names from the war hail from the Old Dominion. Many might not have resigned from the U.S. Army if Virginia does not secede. For all these reasons, all these important reasons, Richmond will become the capital of the new Confederacy. So we see here that Virginia is an important part of the war effort in the South. I don't think that the war lasts as long if Virginia remains in the Union, 
the South, which would not be able to compete in terms of armament production and manpower. Nearly 20% of the soldiers who fight in the South will be from Virginia. These men switching sides could make an impact. Virginia also leads the next wave of states to leave the Union, which we will get into in a future episode. Perhaps those other states in the Upper South do not follow if Virginia does not lead. Imagine just for a second if Lee, Jackson, Stewart, Sherman, Sheridan, and Grant are all on the same side during the war. Talk about your alternative history. And I know you probably don't think about that a whole lot, but it certainly has crossed my mind a time or two. We can leave it right there for next week. Today, we talked about Fort Sumter, Lincoln calling the militia, and Virginia's secession from the Union. Next week, I want to talk about the original plan for the Union, as well as take a little digression to talk about the commander of the Federal Forces at the outset of the war, Winfield Scott. If you like what you hear, please make sure to leave a review. As you heard from this episode, the nation is now divided, and the only way we can put it back together is through reviews. So make sure to do your part. In the episode description, we have a link to the website, Patreon, and there's also Venmo information. Once again, feedback is appreciated. Any questions, comments, concerns, the email is cwweeklypod at gmail.com. Thank you and have a great week.